Uh, are we? We waiting for anyone? There's Miller. We're waiting for any reporters. Okay, so we'll start. Thank you, Cece. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, I'm here with my good friend, Councilmember Denique Miller. He'll speak in a few minutes. Uh, on today's stated agenda, the council will vote on the following finance items. A preliminary budget extender, allowing Mayor de Blasio to submit the fiscal 2020 preliminary budget by February 7th, an expense budget modification and revenue uh, budget modification, implementing the changes to the fiscal 2019 November plan, and 20 Article 11 property tax exemptions, preserving a total of 1,069 units of affordable housing these properties are located in Councilmember Cabrera, Joni, Diaz Sr., Salamanca, Gibson, Cohen, and Rivera's districts. The council will vote on the following land use items. The first item is in the district that I have the honor and privilege of representing. After years of discussion and collaboration with the borough president, the city council will vote to approve zoning text amendments to modify the special garment center district to lift manufacturing preservation requirements that exist on side street blocks, standardize sign regulations, modify bulk regulations to ensure conformance to historical context with the purpose of revitalizing garment manufacturing in that area. There were many, many stakeholders who spent countless hours working to create consensus under the umbrella of the Garment District Steering Committee. So I wanna thank them all for their work. I wanna acknowledge uh, the Economic Development Corporation and their president, James Patchett, and his staff for their partnership and working through many challenging questions on how we both preserve a core of manufacturing in Midtown while acknowledging the profound changes in our economy since that zoning was created in 1987. I really wanna reiterate my thanks for James Patchett. He has been incredible throughout this process. He and I don't agree on everything, as you know from that Amazon hearing, but uh, on this issue, for more than two years, I've been working very closely with him, and I'm really grateful uh, for James and his leadership. We also would not have gotten here without Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. Uh, she and her staff also deserve a special acknowledgement. They're the ones that convened this working group, and this would not have happened without the borough president, so I'm really grateful for Gail. The council will vote to approve with modifications a zoning text amendment to establish restrictions on hotel development within M1 light manufacturing districts uh, citywide. The proposed text amendment would create a new requirement for developers to apply for uh, a special permit in order to develop a hotel in M1 districts, requiring full ULERP uh, public review, including city council approval. This has been a long-standing priority uh, for many years, so I'm proud that we're getting this finally done, and I wanna thank uh, Chair Moyer and Chair Salamanca for shepherding this citywide application through the council. We're also gonna vote on the Franklin Avenue rezoning and the designation of a mandatory inclusionary housing area, option one. Uh, during negotiations, Majority Leader Cumbo secured commitments from the applicant to increase on-site affordable housing as well as to significantly increase future affordable housing developed on the adjacent site. We're gonna vote to approve the Marcus Garvey Village applications with modifications to facilitate the development of seven mixed-use buildings with 676 affordable housing units on unused portions of the Marcus Garvey Village housing development in Brownsville, and this is located in both Councilman Brian S. Barron and Alika Amprey Samuels districts. We're gonna vote to approve with modifications or rezoning in Councilmember Steve Levin's district to facilitate the development of a 12-story commercial office building at 29 J Street in Dumbo. The council will vote on the site selection of two new schools. The first is a 432 seat primary school and a 231 seat 3K and UPK facility in minority leader Steve Matteo's district on the former St. John Village Educational Campus. And the second school is a 380 seat primary school in Councilmember Carlos Menchaca's district on the former site of St. Rosalia Church. 
Uh, we are going to vote on the following piece of legislation today. Uh, introduction 748A, sponsored by Councilman Fernando Cabrera, would establish special oath procedures for violations of taxi and limousine commission laws and regulations. This bill would allow drivers to appear at hearings remotely, require automatic dismissal of duplicative violations, permit hearing officers to reduce penalties for certain violations in the interest of justice, and establish timeliness requirements to facilitate prompt adjudications. Uh, is Fernando here? He is not. Um, if he arrives, he can speak on this. Uh, then we're going to vote on introduction uh, 1288A, sponsored by Councilmember Ben Kalos, which would apply to the campaign finance system that voters just approved uh, to cover elections prior to the 2021 primary election, including special elections held in 2019. I, don't, I want to in, uh, invite one of the campaign finance champions for years getting big money out of politics, Councilmember Ben Kalos up. Thank you. I just wanted to compliment you on your tie. Oh, thank you. Same to you. <laughs> thank you. On November 6th of 2018, New Yorkers overwhelmingly voted to get big money out of New York City politics. After a decades-long fight for real campaign finance reform, New York voters literally took matters into their own hands by voting yes on ballot question one. 1.4 million voters flipped the ballot onto page four and voted, and of those people, 1.1 million people voted yes. And a lot of them waited in line for a long time. And with soggy ballots that somehow <laughs> meant that the machines didn't work in the rain. Uh, but to put that in perspective, almost as many people <laughs> voted in favor of this measure than voted for every single candidate for mayor in 2017. This, uh, New Yorkers could not have been clearer. This was a mandate from New Yorkers to get big money out and reform the system now. I want to thank Speaker Johnson for not only endorsing question one on the ballot, but recognizing this mandate of the voters and for his leadership. Now, despite voters clearly making their voices known that this reform is what they wanted, the change did not take effect until 2021. Introduction 1288 extends the newly adopted campaign finance reforms to the February 2019 special election, the September 29 primary election, and the November 2019 general elections, all three of which are just for public advocate, not to mention any of the vacancies that may occur afterwards, which this would also cover. This legislation follows ballot question one. It lowers the contribution limit from $2,550 for citywide to $1,000. It increases public matching for every small dollar contribution to match every small dollar from six to eight and up to $250 for citywide candidates. It increases public grant for those who opt in from just 55% to 75% of the spending limit. Now, unlike question one, the lower contribution limits and increased matching would retroactively apply to campaigns that choose this new option. All candidates who participate, regardless of which option they choose, will see their debate threshold halved, as well as the minimum funds raised threshold lowered by half, just as other limits are halved, and so that would lower it from 125,000 to 62,500. First, some background on how long I've been working on this. It started back in 2005, been continuing until I was a council member in 2016. I authored introduction 1130. It was co-primary sponsored by council member Fernando Cabrera uh, with 31 sponsors and more than half the council necessary to pass the legislation. I used my position as chair to force a hearing. And somehow I didn't have the support for a floor vote of the council. I reintroduced the legislation in late March of this year's introduction 738, and it has 21 sponsors. When the mayor formed the Charter Revision Commission, I testified in favor of campaign finance reforms on May 9th, June 19th, and July 23rd, and August 9th, calling for reduction of contribution limits, increasing matching fund ratios, and increasing public funds payments. Now, I know I've gone long and shared too much of my life story. To be clear, introduction 1288 is just as question one provides a new option but not a mandate. Just as with question one on the ballot, candidates may still choose to parta participate in the current system of $175 match six to one up to 55% of the spending limit. A candidate for public advocate who opts into the new system would only need to raise $250 from 854 people to see $213,516 matched eight to one for a full 1.7 million 
public grant for 75% of the spending limit, leaving only 15% remaining. With these reforms, candidates for city office can finally run for office without bug big money, instead relying on small dollars and public dollars to win. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. You got it. Congratulations. Next, uh, we're going to vote on introduction 863A, sponsored by Councilmember Jumani Williams, which would prohibit employment discrimination and discriminatory harassment based on an individual's reproductive health choices. Sexual and reproductive health decisions uh, would be defined as any decision by an individual to receive services that relate to the reproductive system, system such as STD prevention, testing and treatment, family planning, and contraception. I want to invite uh, Councilmember Williams up to speak on this important bill. Thank you uh, to the speaker uh, and to Chair Eugene and Majority Leader Cumbo and uh, Council Member Rosenthal, the Women's Caucus, the Progressive Caucus, and all 28 sponsors uh, of this bill. Uh, a little over, I guess, a year ago, I heard about people who were being fired from their jobs uh, because of reproductive decisions that they made. Uh, I wasn't able to get the bill heard and passed at that time, so I do want to say in this uh, session, thank you again to the speaker for allowing it to go through. Uh, when we started working on it, we called it the Boss Bill. It was focused primarily on employers and employees. It's actually now been expanded uh, beyond employers. This bill adds sexual and reproductive health decisions to the human rights law. Uh, it, it was based originally on the laws of uh, Senator Kruger and Assemblymember uh, um, Jaffe, uh, this is one of those things that uh, I couldn't believe wasn't already a law, uh, but federal and state law made uh, leave, left major areas unaddressed, and we just can't allow people to fall through the cracks and the gaps and face discrimination because of their personal choices. Uh, we want to make sure that GOP and others can't trump women's reproductive health decisions. Coverage is wide-ranging, from abortion and birth control usage it, to in vitro fertilization to HIV, HIV testing and counseling. Reproductive rights that lead to reproductive re retribution and discrimination are not rights at all. We need to codify these in these protections. We talk about reproductive justice. We need to take a stand against reproductive injustice. Again, I want to thank everyone. I'm not going to do uh, further thank yous on the floor when this comes to a vote. I'm just very proud that our municipal government is stepping up uh, where uh, our federal government is uh, doing some terrible things. Thank you. Thank you. You look sharp today, Jamani. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm proud to pass this at the same time uh, as Council Member Oh, I took all the papers. Council Member Cumbo will have the candy for you. Thank you. Oh, nice. Thanks, Jamani. Uh, next, we are going to vote on the package of legislation requiring the reporting of sexual abuse in city jails. Introduction 933B, sponsored by Majority Leader Cumbo, would require the Department of Correction to report on incidents of sexual abuse and harassment to incarcerated individuals. And introduction 1090A, introduced by Councilmember Danny Drum, would require the Department of Correction to report on incidences of sexual abuse, harassment, and force by Department of Correction staff to people visiting city jails. I want to invite uh, the majority leader up to speak on her bills. Unfortunately, Councilmember Drum's not able to join us today. Thank you, Ch Speaker Johnson. Today we are passing our bill 933B. Today we are in a very important time in history where we are bringing issues that have been into the shadows out in the open that have been far too long uh, swept under the rug. 933BA is a local law that would require the Department of Correction to provide detailed public quarterly reports on incidents of sexual abuse. The rates of sexual violence in our facilities are alarming and above national averages. Individuals who are incarcerated often come into our facilities having already been victimized. 86% of women who are incarcerated have already reported experiencing sexual violence in their lifetime. And we know that LGBTQ individuals experience disturbing rates of violence as well. We cannot allow them to be re-victimized and with impunity under our watch. Our values of equity, fairness, and justice as a city must be applied to all New Yorkers. 63% of sexual assaults are not reported generally. Within our city jails during 2016 to 2017, the number of allegations, including staff on inmate allegations and inmate on inmate allegations, has gone up almost 40%, climbing past 1,100 incidents last year. 
For sexual assault behind bars to end, it will require cultural changes both within the prisons and the general population. Passing this bill would not have been possible without the support of so many bright and passionate minds. I want to thank the New York State Downstate Coalition for Crime Victims, Safe Horizon, the New York City Alliance Against Sexual Assault, the Prisoner's Rights Project at the Legal Aid Society, as well as the special shout out to Kayla Simpson, staff attorney at the Prisoner's Rights Project. Advocate Kelly Grace Price, the founder of Hashtag Close Rosies, and the tremendous courage and bravery of the survivors that helped and guided us on this piece of legislation. Lastly, I would like to acknowledge the New York City Council drafting attorney, Alana Sivin, and the tremendous guidance from Brian Crow, Deputy Director, Justice Division at the Council. Thank you so much, Speaker Corey Johnson, for this opportunity and for having such and powerful voice in making sure that we pass legislation that really impacts women. And so this is really a powerful time in our council where we are really addressing the issues of women that have been swept under the rug for far too long. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. And uh, you're coming back up in a second, you All and Danique. Right. Uh, very, very important uh, bill we're about to discuss. Introduction 633A, sponsored by Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, would require the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics to report on an annual basis data from every city agency looking at gender, ethnicity, and race at multiple pay bands to find instances of pay disparity. After receiving the data from DCAS, the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics would issue a report to the Mayor and to the Speaker of the Council and post the same report publicly on the MOTA website and on the Open New York website. The Council on an annual basis would be given 90 days of access to employment level data for all city workers to conduct its own analysis. I want to invite Majority Leader Cumbo to speak on this bill as well as uh, Chair Danique Miller. Uh, they have done so much work on this for so long. Uh, I am extremely, extremely proud of both of them. They're gonna tell you why this bill is such a big deal. Uh, I just gave you some sort of wonky information about how it's gonna work, but they're gonna talk about the real impact it's gonna have on our city's workforce and this uh, real persistent uh, pay inequity that's existed for far too long. It is a giant step forward for pay equity. We're using a data-driven approach to find and eliminate instances of unequal pay in New York City's workforce, which we know has a hugely negative impact on people of color and on women, and especially on women of color in the workforce. So I can't thank Lori and Danique enough. I am very proud. This bill has been around for a long time. It did not get done in the last council. Uh, but I am really proud that we're ending the year getting this bill done. So I want to invite the majority leader up and then the chair up to speak on this bill. Thank you. Money, 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 money. <laughs> I am really excited today. Today is a historical day. This has been a long time coming for over 11 years. Power NY have been on the steps of City Hall advocating and fighting to bring transparency to the pay inequities that we all know exist here in New York, but particularly within our city agencies. This is an opportunity for us to be able to bring light to an issue, but most importantly to bring equity to an issue. So imagine these dynamic men right here and this fantabulous woman standing here in the middle making less than these men just because of either the color of my skin or because I'm a woman. And that would not stand here. So it's important that we make sure that the equity that we experience, that all city workers have this particular opportunity. The reason why this took so long is because we wanted to find a way that would bring transparency while also protecting people's identity as well as their personal information. We have this now in a way that we can look at the data. The city council will now become an equal branch um, to the mayor side and that we will now both have access to the same information so that individuals can be better informed about where pay inequities exist. This came out of a very inspirational group of dynamic women, predominantly African-American and Latino women mm -hmm. of CWA 1180, who brought this issue to light through a lawsuit. 
And it is through that that we are now standing here uh, delivering to you this particular piece of legislation that's going to be monumental and is really going to change our work dynamic and our work ethic. And it's, you know, as, as we're coming to a close this month in December, it has really been brought to light in how many systemic ways that women are under attack. And when we see issues of pay inequity, when we started World AIDS Day and hearing that predominantly women of color are still the fastest growing number of incidents and cases that are reported, when we look out and we see the sexual assault and sexual violence playing out on television today um, with the Harvey Weinstein case and the Me Too movement that's happening, and then we see what's happening with Jasmine Headley in HRA and how women and mothers are under attack, and we're passing this legislation today also to bring light to the fact that inequity still exists, particularly for black and brown women. It's imperative that here in the city council that we do all that we can in order to bring light to issues, but also to bring resolution. And to our mayor, Bill de Blasio, I was inspired when I went to your state of city, state of the city, and you addressed that you wanted New York City to be the fairest fair city in the world. And so this legislation speaks to your goals. We look forward to passing this legislation, and we look forward to continuing to work together. I particularly, at this time, I, I didn't have an opportunity to do it earlier, but I want to thank Monica Abend on my staff, who has been instrumental in working so very hard for this legislation. I thank you. Everybody knows how fierce of a champion that you have been for this legislation. And to Donique Miller, he has been an incredible advocate, bringing so much bad. guidance, intelligence, knowledge, and history yes. uh, to this particular issue so that we could bring it forward in the way that we have today. His insight, um, his power and strength and experiences have been incredible. And I also want to thank Speaker Corey Johnson, who this would have been an easy issue to walk away from. No one's wanted to touch this for over a decade, but he ran into it straight on, head on, with laser focus, and that's why we are here today. So I thank all of them for being here and for supporting this particular piece of legislation, as well as public advocate Letitia James, who has fought so hard her entire life. And as uh, Donna Summer says, she's, uh, she works hard for the money. She's one of the hardest working women I know. So thank you all so very much, and thank you for this opportunity, Speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. Danique? Not a bigger champion for workers in this city than this man. Thank you so much, uh, Speaker Johnson. Thank you for, for, for allowing us the opportunity to be here today. As you said earlier, this is uh, been 11 years, um, but we've been on this uh, for the past three years. We've introduced this legislation, work with advocates and work with women and, and uh, workers throughout the city, those who have been disenfranchised uh, through pay equity. and. Um, now we are actually going to vote this into law. So I'm excited about that. But after years of uh, tense legal battles and negotiations, we've made a breakthrough in the ongoing efforts to combat systematic racism, unconscious bias, and our city's values, and how they value women and people of color in their workforce, the core of the civil service and merit-based system. We will pass landmark pay equity legislation 633 that finally lifts the curtain on extreme pay disparities that have limited the upward mobility of the earning potential of these dedicated workforce members who have toiled for generations only to see that they've ascend, their ascendance slowed by deep-seated culture, nepotism, privilege, and sexism. For years, the administration acted in a way that contradicted its principal core fairness and equity for all New Yorkers, regardless of gender or race, by resisting our efforts to obtain key demographic information that would effectively eliminate pay discrimination. But we pushed hard for a bill that would, be, would, would enable us, through data analysis necessary to fix these inequities and promote a genuine merit-based civil service system. I want to thank Majority Leader Combo, Public Advocate James, uh, 1180 uh, President Gloria Middleton, and uh, former President, my friend and mentor, Arthur Chiotis, for bringing it to us, and of course, Speaker Corey Johnson, for their collaboration in achieving a hard fought and long awaited victory for women and minorities unjustly passed over for promotion and denied their basic rights to achieve pay equity. 
this is so very important. This is something that we've been doing for years and we've been having this conversation. Let me just say, you know, for those who don't know my other life, I was a union president, business agent, and so forth. And there was so many, and, and I'm only here because my colleagues in the labor movement thought that we needed a voice here. I, I'd much rather prefer at that moment to stay where I was. Um, but this is one of those moments where it really manifests itself in, in a big way. The things that we could not do in that voice that we did not have on this side. To be able to work with this powerful group of folks that you see here, the Speaker, the Majority Leader, and my colleagues in government that understand that pay equity is, is a really, really big issue. That equity and justice for all has been the mantra of this, this, this council and to stand here today really justifies why we are all here. So thank you so very much. Thank you. Thanks to me. Thanks, Lori. It's a big day. This is big, very, very, very important. Uh, we're also going to vote on pre-considered introduction number 1300 in relation to the naming of 68 thoroughfares in public places, including Chief of Detectives uh, William Alley, Chief Ronald Spadafora, and Police Officer Manuel Manny Vargas, who all died of illnesses related to their service on 9-11. And we're also going to be voting to rename some of these places for some cultural icons. Christopher Wallace, a.k.a. Biggie Smalls, yeah. renaming a street after him today. The Wu-Tang Clan, naming out a street after them today. And Woody Guthrie, we're naming a street mm -hmm. after him today. Now, last but not least, the final legislation sponsored by uh, our public advocate and the Attorney General-elect, Letitia James, introduction 1075A would require the Department of Sanitation to establish a pilot program to collect organics from buildings wholly occupied by one or more city agencies and institutional special use buildings. The bill also mandates that DSNY provide education and outreach to individuals in participating buildings. Uh, and I congratulate the public advocate. It's her last meeting with us as public advocate. Uh, and so a sad day, but I'm happy for her. So that concludes the agenda for today's stated meeting, the last stated meeting of 2018. It has been a busy year, and I look forward to proceeding with today's votes. I'm happy to take any questions that are on topic on any of these issues first. Anything on topic? Bridget. So the good news is this passed on November 6th and the CFB has been hard at work ever since. And if we look at the scope of this election, in 2013 there were 146 candidates, in 2017 there were 147. Last I checked yesterday, there are only 23 candidates for the public advocates race. Um, I'm now being advised by a member of the media, it is now up to 25 as of this morning. By the time this press conference is over, it'll be 25. <laughs> Uh, so th that being said, regardless if it continues to grow at this rate, it will still be a fraction of what they are used to doing. We think that this is a great test run. Their system is already able to raise limits because we saw them do that recently. They can already add special elections with different rates. We o they already do that. They have to do that for this election too. And ultimately, uh, they raised two concerns, one around uh, uh, sending checks and I, I'm willing to work with them on how to send a wire. I do it all the time and uh, members of the business community so we can help with that. And I'm a software developer. I offered to sit down and help them with their software, uh, but I don't think that'll be a problem either. And I think they mentioned something about wanting to do things on paper and I'm great at Excel and I'm happy to sit down with them and show them how Excel works, but I'm really confident that we can get this done and that this is a great opportunity for a test run. Any other questions on topic? Okay, off topic. Yes, sir. Well, I support legalization of marijuana. I've supported it uh, for some time, and I think that uh, it's the right thing to do. We tried prohibition almost 100 years ago, and it didn't work for a variety of reasons. I think that people, uh, especially communities of color, have been uh, unfairly 
uh, criminalized for far too long with uneven, disproportionate sentences. I think we should expunge marijuana convictions to give people clean criminal justice records so it doesn't haunt them the rest of their lives. I think there's important questions. We want to make sure that any revenue raised goes back into communities that have been affected for far too long. I also think we can take a chunk of that money and put it into the subway system and do other things. There are going to be some issues related to implementation of this, to the licenses. Those are things that we have to talk about, but generally I support this. I know the governor talked about it in a speech earlier this week. The mayor is talking about it today. I think many colleagues here on the council have been talking about it for a long time. Uh, so I'm glad that we got here today. Did you want to say something, Janique? Yep. yep, go ahead. So um, as, as the chair of the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus, <clears throat> certainly this is something that we've been talking about. Also, um, representing a community that for nine out of the last 10 years has been over policed and have had the highest number of marijuana arrests and summonses in the entire city. Certainly this is a big issue and, I, and, and I'm glad that um, we were given the opportunity to hold hearings here and really bring this to the forefront and so that we can go from talking about policy to legalization but also um, having real conversations about uh, communities that have been disproportionately impacted and how do we really move forward with this and 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 because I've heard that um, this is going to level the playing field and that's just not the case because there are so many communities and so many individuals that have been disproportionately impacted that continue to be impacted they don't that lack upward mobility because of this um, the, that they have been convicted of low-level marijuana crime. So there's a lot of conversation. I'm, I'm so glad that we are at this point, but I, I just want them to know that I am, along with the members of the caucus, that are, are, are ready and willing to stand and continue to have that conversation about policy that is just and that we can move forward with. Thank you. Rosa? I saw the story, of course, and the council is looking into it. We operate off of the controller's directive, which uh, lays out some of the issues at play here. It's a lot of information that we're looking at, and so I, I don't have anything definitive to say at this point, except that we are looking at it, we're taking it seriously, and if there's anything that we have to tighten up on this, we will look to do that in the future. Uh, I can say, I can say internally we're looking into it. The general counsel's office is looking into it. And um, do you, uh, like, are, are you kind of, have you looked at the process for how this gets vetted? I mean, we're, we're looking at that. You know, I, I inherited this. Um, it's been going on for a long time. Um, you know, there's the $5,000 limit on subcontractors where it needs to be bid out. That's a council rule. That's not the law of the city of New York. That's not the controller's directive. The controller's directive, I believe, is at $20,000. Um, the council created a rule at $5,000. So um, we're looking at that um, because typically for historically, not just in the last year, but for I don't know how long, we've never um, vetted subcontractors below $5,000, but if there are things that we need to tighten up to ensure that everything's appropriate and above board, I'm willing to do that. But the first thing we're, do, we're doing, since your story came out, is looking at the, the process and figuring out if there are any deficiencies and if there are any things that we can do to tighten up that process. I think it's a case-by-case -case basis. You know, for me personally, I've always stayed away from that. Um, you know, I don't think I would feel comfortable personally um, doing that. Um, but there could be instances where there is nothing wrong and where there isn't an appearance of impropriety. So it's hard to make a blanket statement on this across the board, but personally, 
I don't think I would feel comfortable, and to my knowledge, in the past, I've never, I've never done this with regard to OTPS or anything related to government office here at the council while I was speaker or before I was speaker when I was in the body. So I wouldn't feel comfortable doing it. But again, we're looking at it and we're taking a very granular, in-depth, detailed look at the entire process, how we've gotten to where we are and the things we can do to tighten it up. Yes. Hi. You're talking about for the, the new detention facility, the new jail yeah. in Manhattan? One, two, five, one, two. Yes, yes. So first of all, thank you for being here um, today. Um, so I'm glad to see that the mayor is talking with the community on this. I know that the mayor met yesterday in Chinatown with Councilmember Chin and some community leaders uh, to talk about how some folks have feel, felt like they've been left out of the process. Uh, which we don't want anyone to feel that way. Um, it's unclear to me how much progress we've made so far, but public input is always welcome. Closing Rikers Island remains a priority for me and I believe for the vast majority of the city council. And so we need to cite borough-based facilities across the city. I wanna thank Councilmember Chin for her work on this. She uh, is a champion for her community. I think there are some local concerns. I'm sensitive to those local concerns. Councilmember Chin's sensitive to those local concerns. Councilmember Chin's the one who asked the mayor to come and meet with community leaders. So the city council will play a role through the Euler process. This is not done uh, yet. I support a site being in Manhattan, but the conversation around what happens on that site, the height and density and what happens on the street and in the neighborhood and what other things can be done for parks and transportation and, and other facilities in the community, I think is an important conversation to have and that's a conversation we'll have uh, through the uh, Euler process. Uh, Community Board One will have the chance to give a recommendation on this in Manhattan. The Borough President will then give a recommendation. It will go to the City Planning Commission and then Councilmember Chin will negotiate what happens on that individual site. So we're just at the beginning of the process. There's still gonna be a lot of time for public input, but I'm really proud of uh, Councilmember Chin for her leadership. Yes, sir. Well, I think, I think this has been um, a, a process where you've seen the city council take this issue on, you've seen district attorneys take this issue on, you've seen state lawmakers take this issue on, you saw this as an animating issue in the gubernatorial election. So I think this has been a process and I think the district attorneys have been a really important voice in this process, a voice about justice, a voice about disproportionate uh, penalties going against communities of color. So what they've done so far, I think actually really helped lay the groundwork uh, to getting us to this point. I'm grateful uh, to DA Vance and DA Gonzalez for their leadership on how to handle uh, low-level marijuana offenses, and I think they've played an important part in today. Bridget? Her legacy is nuanced. Um, you know, she and I have not always seen eye to eye, but personally, I like her. Personally, she and I get along. We haven't always agreed on issues. We haven't always agreed on 
um, how this body should be treated and talked about, and I'll always stand up for the members of this body and the institution. Um, I'm grateful for her service. Certainly, she's accomplished a lot as it results as it relates to affordable housing. I think there's a conversation around the deep affordability that's needed as part of that affordable housing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there clearly have been issues around uh, the Public Housing Authority and what we're seeing right now with Secretary Carson visiting this week and uh, Judge Polly being involved and a consent decree potentially on the table. So. Any legacy, I think for anyone, not just Deputy Mayor Glenn, but any mayor, any speaker, any council member is gonna be nuanced. Um, uh, but I'm grateful for her service. Um, you know, I wanna thank her uh, for serving, even if we haven't always agreed, I wanna thank her for serving the city. I think she, she loves New York City. She's a lifelong New Yorker. And um, so I wanna thank Deputy Mayor Glenn for that. What I'm looking for uh, next is someone who's gonna really take on the challenges that face public housing in New York City, looking for deeper affordability as it relates to new affordable housing, looking for job creation for people that have been underemployed in New York City who are working two or three jobs to make ends meet, to create more economic opportunity. Um, so I think, I think those are all good things. I am a fan of James Patchett. I have no idea if he's under consideration. I haven't agreed with him on everything, but he's always been a straight shooter. He's always been incredibly responsive. And, um, you know, he and I really butted head at the Amazon hearing uh, that we had, but he has always been a gentleman and someone that I can work with. Um, so I don't know if that's an endorsement, but it's a recommendation uh, that he is someone that I hope the mayor is looking at. <coughs> I have no idea. I mean, it's far too early uh, to speculate. It's hard to know. I think, um, again, her legacy is nuanced, and I have no idea if she wants to run. She hasn't told me that. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Which bill? I didn't hear. Yes, yes. Well, everything goes through the legislative process, um, and uh, I think the bill has clear support in the council. I'm hopeful that we'll take care of this next month and the first month um, of the new year. Uh, we're very concerned about the issue. Um, Councilmember Espinal uh, has a bill that I think has probably near unanimous support in the council, but we're still talking to stakeholders as it moves through the process and making sure that we don't rush something, but that we get it done in the right way so that we don't have issues moving forward. But I support the bill, and I think there's wide support in the council. Anyone else? Thank you all for this year. Be, have a safe and happy holidays with your family, especially if you have a new baby. <laughs> we, can, we can do a play date if you want. Yeah.